Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Growing up on the North Dakota Plains, we did not have many trees on our farm. We had the shelter belt along the west and the north side, and then we had one lone cottonwood out in our field. And we valued that lone cottonwood so much that my dad farmed around it all of his life. But now we have Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer, and many other pests and diseases attacking our beloved trees. Today, join guest host Marin Larson as we learn how to fight back with tree planting diversity. Our guest today is John Ball, Professor of Forestry and Extension Forestry Specialist at South Dakota State University. Welcome to the program, John. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, there's been a lot of information out there with this emerald ash borer. Could you talk a little bit about what it is and what it does? You bet. And most people have heard about it by now, but it's always good to have a recap. Emerald ash borer, first of all, is an exotic insect. It's not native to the United States. It's native to East Asia. It was first discovered in the Detroit area about uh, ooh, 2002, but we think it's been in the country even longer. Well, of course, it's spread out from there and has now been found as far west as the Twin Cities area, also Kansas, and then it jumped the whole prairie. We truly are flyover land and is now in Boulder, Colorado. So our concern is sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, we're going to see that insect show up here. Is there anything out there that could help slow it down or eradicate Problem? Well, first of all, we're not going to be able to eradicate it, so it's going to be one of those things we're going to live with, just like taxes. All right, it's always going to be here. But we can moderate the impact of it, and here's what we're going to do. First of all, we need to plant other trees, diversify the landscape, because it only wants ash trees, and it will kill every ash tree once it gets here. Uh, but by planting other trees, we'll still have an urban forest. And if someone watching says, you know what, I have an ash tree in my yard that's my absolute favorite, I never want to lose it. There are very effective treatments now. Very similar to Dutch elm disease treatments that you can inject the tree. The cost is about $100 a year. You have to do it every other year and you'll do it as long as you have money or want the tree. But nevertheless, you can keep your tree. We've had a similar problem with Dutch elm disease, haven't we? That's correct. What we're looking at is a trend here. You know, we lost a lot of elms to Dutch elm disease beginning in late 60s, early 70s, and we're still losing them, you know, throughout western Minnesota and eastern South Dakota. Uh, but what happened is when people cut down their elm trees, they planted ash. And now we have the emerald ash borer that's killing these trees. And one of my fears is everyone's going to run out and just plant one tree. Uh, the Freeman maples, the autumn blaze, become incredibly popular. And 30 years from now, we could have a new insect appear that kills all them. So the lesson we should have learned from Dutch elm disease, and we learned the wrong lesson. The wrong lesson was don't plant elms, and elms are beautiful trees. The lesson we should have learned is diversify the landscape. Look what your neighbors have planted and plant something else. Okay, sounds like a good idea. It is, and you know what? Today's a perfect day to walk around and take a look at some trees that we really ought to be considering. Okay, let's go. All right, thanks. This is a beautiful, is it a burr oak? Yes, it is. Quercus macrocarpa. This is one of my favorite trees, and when I become governor of Minnesota, why not? This will be your state tree. I wrote an article many years ago that this is the true state tree of Minnesota because it's found throughout the state, and it's as tough as all the Minnesotans as well. And it ought to be the South Dakota state tree, too, because it's found everywhere. How old is this tree? Well, you see, that's the thing most people don't understand is oaks are actually fast-growing trees. 
they just get this perception that they're slow growing because they do slow down when they get about 60 or 70, but we do too. Now the tree you're looking at here is 15 years old, planted from a tree this tall. That's and amazing. Isn't it? We can get two foot of growth a year out of a bur oak, but the trick is, and here's the magic elixir you have to apply, is water. Uh, every year this tree gets watered, and it was critical the first year we planted it that it got about uh, a gallon a day, so to speak. So we'd give it maybe seven gallons a week, and we did that all summer and the next summer as well. But if you water the oaks the first two years, uh, they'll begin to grow. They'll sit there the first year, but they'll begin to grow from there. And, and keep in mind, we've got a tree now that's 15 years old that could certainly be here 200 years from now. So it's a great tree. While I love this tree and I'd like to see it planted, I don't want to see it over planted either. So let's look at some other trees to consider as well. Okay, let's go. Well, this looks just like uh, an, the other oak. What's different about this one? Well, and you're right, this is another oak, and, and again, I don't want to see anything over planted, but here's two really nice oaks, the bur oak that we just looked at, and also this one is the swamp white swamp. oak. Swamp, okay. Yeah, pretty ugly name, really, when you think about it, swamp white oak, but think of it, if it grows in a swamp, it probably can grow in your yard, too. Well, I've noticed a big pile of mulch here. Is that uh, something that helps the tree so you don't have to mow, or does it have other... Well, it's doing a couple of things here. And first of all, I like to leave trees branched the ground. If you, if you notice a swamp white oak, the branches start at the base, and we've kept all the branches all the way up. And to me, that adds to the attraction of this tree because it just is gorgeous with those glossy leaves and the, and the white underside. And so I want to really show that off. Are there acorns on this one? I don't see any. Not yeah. yet, okay. but there will be. And again, I know there's going to be some people that say, well, I don't like the acorns because I trip over them. But you know what? A squirrel will be happy. So uh, you're, you're going to have a tree with a little bit of a mess. And, and it's not overdone, but there will be a few acorns. And here, they're just going to fall on the mulch, another good reason for mulch. But what I really like about the mulch is it's guarding space. We have turf, and we have an area for the tree. And so we don't need to mow up next to the base. We don't need to use any weed killer up next to the base. We're not trying to mow up next to the base. We're just leaving it mulched out this far. And, and of course, the key is with mulching, mulch out but not up. Okay. You know, we don't want those mulch volcanoes that are so common. Uh, so this way, we've just spread it out, not too deep, but far. I wish everybody that is looking at this now could feel of this. This feel just like plastic. It's a very and they're tough, so tough. Yeah, it's a very tough leaf. Uh, you know what? If you get a windy day, and we certainly have those. And nice wind oh, makes yeah. that noise. And the other thing with a nice wind is you get to see the underside. And you get a nice windy day, and that Absolutely. that gloss and that light just really shows up. And the other thing too is this grows even faster than the other oak. This one we're looking at is 12 years old. And look at the size. Oh my goodness! It's got. Yeah. And if you look at the growth this year so far, here's how much it's growing. And so, you know, it's not a tree that people are going to have to wait forever to enjoy. Now, with these trees, these are good in Zone 4? Well, you know what? Anywhere in Minnesota you could plant this, or South Dakota. It gets a little iffy when you get up into northern North Dakota. Okay. But otherwise, it'll do fine anywhere. But it does have one problem. And that is, it has to be on a soil with a pH that is at least less than about 7.4. Because if it's a very alkaline site, this tree will turn horribly yellow. And okay. unfortunately, we have some of those trees around well, here. Well, yeah, well. people try them and then isn't the right fit. Right. The right so, plant for the right place. Bingo. And if you just check the soil pH before they plant, to me, one of those basic requirements, you know, every garden center ought to be a law. When you come in, you got to show your soil test in order to buy a tree. You know, all these trees the first year are baby. You know, you've got to give them water every week when it turns dry. I'm not worried about fertilizers. I'm not worried about any magical solutions, but water, 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 water. And of course, if you have a wet spring, you can avoid it during that time period. But it always amazes me when people plant a tree, they'll just add a little water at it and figure they're done. And the tree dies and they call and say, well, my tree's dead. It'd be like, well, you know what? We bought a puppy and we gave it a drink of water the first day, but we didn't give any water for a month and oh, it's dead. What's the surprise? You know what? Trees are like uh, critters. They require a little care and the biggest care they require is water. Water, a little mulch and a little pruning after they become established. Uh, that's all they need. Good advice. 
Are there other uh, trees you want to show us today? Oh, absolutely. We got a few more outstanding specimens just down the road. This looks like another oak. What type of oak is this? Well, right, I am showing you another oak, and I have talked about the need for the diversity, so I'm not suggesting we plant even more oaks. But I'm showing you this one for a particular reason. This is northern pin oak, which is native to Minnesota. And this is also a tree like many oaks that has to be on a soil that's not extremely alkaline. The only oak we can plant on really alkaline soils is the bur oak, one of those trees that I showed you. The swamp white oak, we don't need it to be very high in alkalinity before it turns yellow, and northern pin oak's very sensitive too. When we tested the soil here at this site, it was about seven, a little over seven, seven two, I think it was. And so we could plant this tree and look, the leaves are green, it's a nice Lovely. tree. Lovely, yeah. and the shape is good. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice looking tree, but just a hundred feet behind you is another northern pin oak, which is on a soil that's about seven eight. And look how bright yellow that tree is. Uh, you know, it's not a very attractive tree. It's a, uh, it's a teaching moment for our students, so I've left it. But it really points out the need to check the site you're planting the tree, not just the yard, to make sure that the soils are compatible with the tree you're planting. Well, that tree looks really unhealthy and probably on its way out. It is, but you know what? They die a very slow lingering death with chlorosis. Usually you kill them before they flat out die. So I'll probably get to use that tree as a teaching moment for about another five years. What is this beautiful tree with the leaves? They're just this thick and nice and beautiful and nobody's chewing on them. Nothing's chewing on them. It looks like a great tree. This one is, and you're right. The leaves are, have a nice shine to them too. This is the Triumph Elm. Um, its close cousin is the Accolade Elm. I actually like both Accolade Elm and Triumph Elm. Uh, these are hybrid elms. Uh, they're Asian origins where, of course, Dutch elm disease developed. Uh, we blame it on the Dutch, but they just isolated it. It's actually an Asian disease. And so these trees do not get Dutch elm disease. So again, uh, you know, I said that we learned the wrong lesson with Dutch elm disease, and that was not to plant elms. Elms are wonderful trees, and we are planting them back to have them as part of our diversity on campus. Do they get as large as the other elms that we lost, or are they, does this stay kind of shorter and plumper? Or? No, in fact, uh, it has a similar size and shape with time. Now, uh, again, the leaves are a little bit smaller than what we have on the American elm, so most people could look at it and say it's not quite it, but it does have that vase-shaped form we like with the American elms, and its growth rate is incredible. This is how much this has grown so far this year. Oh my goodness. I know, and the first years when we start planting them, they'll grow five to six foot a year. So people like this because this is as close as we can get to instant shade. You know, the tree we're looking at here, I think has been in the ground for about uh, nine years. Really is doing well. It is, and, and as we're losing our American elms, the Dutch elm disease on campus, and we do want elms as part of our diversity here, we're planting back, uh, we're out planting some American elms back too, Princeton elm, but we're all planting a lot of the hybrid elms, and the uh, Triumph and the Accolade are just two of my absolute favorites, and with proper pruning can look nice. If you don't prune them, they look horrible. Now, with the trees that we've seen just up until now, is it easily found? I mean, do you have to go to a nursery, a specialty nursery, or can, can you just go to the nursery and buy this now? Uh, all the trees that we're looking at here today are readily obtainable. That if you go to your local garden center, and I always like people to shop local, uh, but if they go to a local garden center and they say, you know what, I heard about that Triumph Elm, I'd really like one. If by some chance they're out of them or they don't have one, the wholesale nurseries that uh, supply them certainly have it. So everything we're looking at, they shouldn't have too much difficulty of finding. They're all local. You should be able to find every one of these trees fairly close to you in Minnesota or eastern South Dakota. Well, that's good news. Well, this looks like another Triumph Elm. Yes, it is, but you'll notice the leaves look like the elm, but the shape isn't anywhere near what the other one was. I was noticing that. It looks a little uh, out of shape. Well, that's, that's being polite. I'd go with downright ugly. Now, by the way, we are keeping this as a teaching tool on campus, and the reason for that is that 
All these new hybrid elms require a lot of training. What that means is pruning for about the first 10 years of their life. And if you don't prune them every year, they will grow that three to five foot a year, but you'll notice this one's growing this way. Yeah. Yeah, rather than up. And it's kind of got a two trunks almost. Oh yeah, two, three, four. You know, it's got multiple. It doesn't know which way it wants to go, but this lower stem should have been taken off when the branch was only this small. And up here you can see we have almost three and one of those should have gone. And you can even look at the top it's still curving over to the side. And we leave this one here just so we get the point across to students is that trees are like kids, they need to be trained. And if you let them run wild in the street, kind of like we're letting this one to do, it turns out to be uh, out of shape as you put it, or ugly as I put it. Uh, and so I tell people that if they're going to plant the hybrid elms, which are wonderful trees, they certainly need to have annual pruning for the first 10 years. And then we also have some pruning that may go on for much of its life. This tree looks uh, like something we've never seen before. What is this? This is the Kentucky coffee tree. And despite the name Kentucky, it's actually native to South Dakota and Minnesota. So it's really one of our own. It's also a tree that grows slow when it's little for about the first five or six years and then speeds up. What's interesting is we have planted this tree in some areas of campus and for the first five or ten years it grows slower than almost anything else. But by age 30 it's caught up with everybody. It's as big as the ash. So this is a tree that, yeah, planted. I mean, you're looking at now a 25-year-old tree and it's just beautiful. What about those big seed pods? Is well, that, is you know, that these, an issue? These big seed pods we get on this tree and I'll pull one of them off here. This is why it's called Kentucky coffee tree, because you break a pot off and right there's your coffee bean. Now that bean is still a little fresh, but it will turn black by this fall and be as hard as a rock. And you know what? You can make coffee out of it. Isn't this the tree that has the beautiful flowers in the spring? You know and what? And that's it, why everybody wants this tree? Well, no. This is the tree that does have beautiful flowers yes. in the spring, but nobody knows about it oh. until you walk by it. And okay. the flowers are fragrant. Uh, but you have to walk by, but you're walking by the tree, and there's one in Mankato I know about. When you walk down the street, you just pick up this very light hint. Now, now by the way, uh, this is a tree that does have separate sexes. There's male coffee trees and there's female coffee trees. The female flowers have a nice fragrance. The males don't, but that's kind of typical. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. And this is a female because we've got the pods. Mm -hmm. now. Minnesota developed a cultivar called Stately Manor, and it's a male coffee tree. So if you're one of those folks that don't like to look at the pods, you can buy a cultivar from University of Minnesota that doesn't have those. Me, I like the pods. They add to the winter interest. and That's, that's true. Yeah, they do. And it gives something for the kids to rake up. In. This is a maple. This is one of the Freeman maples. This particular cultivar is Autumn Blaze. Unfortunately, the Freeman maples will become a little chaotic on high pH soils too. So once again, test your soils before you plant them. Now, this year we had a wet spring, so this one is a little bit more chlorotic than normal, but it still has that brilliant red fall color that people like on all the Freeman maple cultivars, such as Autumn Blaze, Sienna Glen, and a number of others. I like this tree because it is fast growing, but I really have a couple problems with it. First of all, it is a little touchy. You got to check your pH of the soil. The other is everybody's planting these. Yeah, and so my fear is 30 years from now, some insect's going to show up or some disease that attacks these trees. And we're going to say, oh my goodness, we lost our elms and we planted ash. We lost our ash and we planted this maple. And again, we didn't learn the lesson of diversifying the landscape. So again, if someone looks down their street and they see a lot of these, don't plant them anymore. We got plenty. But you know what, I can show you some maples that look a lot better. Looks like another maple here. This is beautiful, it's a little different. Does it stay this narrow? It'll pop out a little bit, uh, but this is the Korean maple. And what I like about it, and for some of your viewers that may have come from out east of that, and they say, well, I wish I could grow a Japanese maple, which of course, beautiful plants. Yeah. But even go up to them and say, mint a soda, they die, because it's just too cold. But this one has leaves that look quite similar uh, and is much hardier. So 
Korean maple, we can grow at least halfway up through Minnesota and into eastern South Dakota. When it's young, it is a little bit more upright, but it will spread, but it's not going to get much bigger. You're looking at almost the total height of the plant. Uh, it will have just brilliant red fall color. So, you know, I certainly don't suggest people plant this as a shade tree unless they like sitting down a lot. This is not a tree I would plant out on a farmstead as a windbreak, for example. But in a nice sheltered area such as this garden or in town, any town, you have enough protection, the tree will do quite nicely and, and add a little accent to almost any garden. I have a question. I have Japanese beetles on my roses. Should I be concerned? Well, Japanese beetles are in Minnesota now. We haven't seen them all over the state, but we've definitely seen a lot in the metropolitan area and slightly west and south of that. And Japanese beetles are really definitive. They've got a shiny, very attractive uh, shell, a dark kind of green, uh, emerald bright green, and they have specific white dots around the back abdomen. They feed on the foliage of roses and grapes, raspberries, linden trees. They have definitely some plants that they love to feed on. And roses, they like the flowers and the foliage. So we'll find them eating and feeding on the pollen as well as on the, the leaves. So the best way to control Japanese beetles is to go out with a bucket of soapy water. And believe it or not, the best time is 7 p.m., 7 o'clock in the evening. So maybe take a glass of wine and a bucket of soapy water, go out to your garden, and uh, hold the bucket underneath the roses or grapes and tap the insects, the adults, into the soapy water. So they'll drown and die. That's the best way to control them. What's going on at 7 o'clock in the evening is that adult is sending out a pheromone signaling other Japanese beetles, come here, I've got the best food in town. And the other beetles sense that and they come in and congregate on those plants. So if you pick them off that time in the evening, you eliminate that hormone and reduce the numbers coming into your garden. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, this one is the legacy sugar maple, uh, by some authorities considered a black maple rather than a sugar maple, but only botanists would argue that point. Either way, it's a beautiful tree. How many years did you think it took to get it to this point? Well, this particular tree we planted in 1996, and, and I remember the day, because we planted it as an Arbor Day celebration, the last uh, Friday in April, and it snowed that day when we planted it. So what you're looking at here is an 18-year-old tree. It's got an awful dense canopy, though. Does that affect maybe the, the grass growing or anything like that? The grass will be a little thinner underneath there, but since I don't really care about grass, another good reason to put down mulch. You know, let's get rid of grass competition. So, so you're right, it is a very dense canopy, but what this tree's noted for is it's very drought tolerant, and of course, we certainly get our droughts out here. Uh, you notice the leaves are very thick, leathery. The fall color can be spectacular. Well, that would make it worth it, wouldn't it? Yeah, the only problem is that if we have a very early frost, uh, the leaves will turn brown. And so what's early? You really don't want to frost until mid-October to really get the color change. Uh, this is the last maple to have fall color. When you have it, it's gorgeous. It is, it's beautiful. I love the shape, they've been pruning it right. We pruned a little bit because we have to get off the sidewalks. This one was planted fairly close to sidewalks. And why would argue close off the sidewalks, let's keep the branches low? I lose those arguments. Uh, but uh, it's, it's been a great tree. But you know what? I've got another maple that I think is even nicer. Well, let's go find that. This is the State Street maple. Uh, it's an Asian maple tree. It's a, it's a small tree. It'll get about 25 feet tall, almost a very nice rounded habit. To me, it looks like a small, daintier Norway maple. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very tough tree. Uh, the soil it's on right now is not even soil. It's more or less construction rubble. So it'll take almost any site you give it. Doesn't require a lot of pruning, not like the elms we've seen. 
Uh, essentially, you, this has never been pruned, in fact. My goodness, yeah, it's so, really nice. And look at that beautiful bark. You know, I like the bark, but you know what you'd really like? If we were standing here in late September, early October, the fall color is a pumpkin yellow. Well, we might be back. <laughs> you know what? Just to see the color, it'd be worth the trip. This is a great maple tree. What else are you going to show us? Well, you know what? We're into diversity, so let me show you a tree that, you know what? You'll probably be the only one in your neighborhood to have it. Heck, you might be the only person in town to have it. Well, I dare say this is probably not a maple. You're right. And, you know, we looked at a lot of maples and oaks today because they're wonderful trees, very commonly available. But again, I don't want to see anyone plant too many oaks or too many maples. So I like to kind of show you an unusual tree. And this is a shag bark hickory. And how old is it? Well, this one in the nursery is probably about 10 years old. We planted it last year. Now, again, you can buy this not at every garden center. Most garden centers aren't going to carry it because I used to work at garden centers, and there's always two questions people ask. How fast does it grow? And does it have any fruit? Kind of like, when should you plant a tree? Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah, there you go. But on this particular tree, you know, we've looked at the growth rate of the maples, the growth rate of the elms, growth rate of the oaks. Growth rate on this last year was this. Just not fast enough. Not fast enough. Now, again, it'll, it'll grow about this fast when it gets established. But still, I know there's people watching and say, you know what, I'm going to be dead before that tree's big. Well, guess what? You're going to be dead no matter what. So let's plant a couple of these, and it does produce a nut, a hickory nut. The hickory nut is edible, but you know what? Squirrels will like it too. So, but again, if, if we planted hickories in our landscapes? At least one. Well, okay, I'll go with one. I'll take the one, but I'd like several. I'd oh, love you to, would? Yeah. Well, I'd, what about the hickory insects? Well, they're not many, uh, and we don't really have a lot of hickories overseas, so it's not a tree that I lie awake at night worried about something coming to attack it, and we'll never get that many, but imagine if you were to drive through a... Um, Minnesota community. And as you're driving down the street, you are looking at maples and you are looking at oaks, but you see some coffee trees and you see some hickories mm -hmm. and you see some other trees. Well, now you know that they have a diversity of plantings and if a pest arrives, such as emerald ash borer, they're not going to lose all their trees at one time. So, you know, even the slow growing trees have a place. Yes, I, they certainly do. This is a beautiful tree. Uh, it is, and if, and if only one person... I'll maybe take two. <laughs> there you go. And if somebody else out there watching plants this tree, my life is fulfilled. All right, we've got a little bit more diversity out there in the Minnesota landscape. I learned so much today, and I'm sure that anybody who sees the program would feel the same way. And thank you so much for taking the time out to come and visit. Well, thanks. I've really enjoyed the opportunity. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.